Ah, cool. Um, good morning. Thank you all for coming. Um, I've got about an hour, and I was told to talk about new types of cannabis, old types of cannabis, harms related to cannabis, motivations for change, and a little bit around some clinical issues. Um, so that's what I'm going to go and do. Um, I'm going to try and go forward, though. Um, am I being an idiot? I'm going to ask that question, am I being an idiot? Well, I think by asking it, the answer is probably yes. There we are. Um, most of the stuff I'm going to talk about is free on our website, um, which is globaldrugsurvey.com. We've also got a YouTube channel, and that website's got lots of links to apps and various resources, some of which I'll refer to today. If you want any other information that's not on the website, email me and I'll happily share it, and I'll also make sure there's a version of this talk available um, for people to send out. So my day job is a drug and alcohol psychiatrist, um, but the other thing I do is I run an organisation called the Global Drug Survey, which is comprised of a network of researchers, academics, harm reductionists from 19 different countries, and together we run, I think, what's the world's biggest drug survey now. So our last two surveys have had around 100,000 people who take part. Um, and that's a really fantastic thing, because lots of people share really interesting information with us. We get lots of people to take part because we collaborate with big media organisations around the world and in exchange for their support, we give them data and they write stories, most of which are kind of sensible actually. And we also write academic papers and ultimately we do all of this because we'd like to try and make drug use safer regardless of the legal status of the drug. So we're not funded by any governments um, and what we try and do is share information so people can make informed decisions. So this is the stuff I'm going to do, and um, I better start off by highlighting the fact that, not surprisingly, cannabis is the most commonly used drug in Scotland. This is data from your victim and crime survey last year. Um, so 5% of adults using in the last year, um, that goes up to about 1 in 8 when you look at people aged between the 16 and 24. But this represents overall a decline over the last um, 8 years, so it was 6.3% in 2008 and 9. Um, as with all other drugs, there's a far higher rate of use among um, men than women. Ratio is about two to one. Um, but the number of people using synthetic cannabinoids is still really low. And I want to mention that because we get a disproportionate amount of stuff in the press around synthetic cannabinoids. And I guess what's important is they're used by a small group of the population, but their impact on that small vulnerable group is really huge. And that's something I'm going to talk about today. This is data from last year's Global Drug Survey. Um, I put this up here to say lots of people who take our survey like taking lots of drugs. Um, and about 10% of that group had ever used synthetic cannabinoids. But if you look at last year's use, it was actually less than 2% had used synthetic cannabis products. More people reported using a Tizolan than synthetic cannabinoid products. So they are still used by a minority of people, even among people who like taking drugs and have an experience of using a lot of drugs. And we do get a lot of information on cannabis use, and um, part of the reason is, is we ask questions that are really relevant uh, to people who like using cannabis, like defining what the perfect stone is. So we've got effect profiles on cannabis users from about 140,000 people now. Um, so this is stuff from last year's Scottish cannabis users. Um, and what it says is, there's a lot of people out there who've smoked cannabis in the last year who smoke it a lot. So 40% having used more than 100 days in the last year. This kind of matches the sort of uh, results we get from your own um, victim and crime survey, suggesting about 25 to 30% of cannabis users are using every day. Um, most common uh, method of use uh, is uh, in a joint with tobacco, like most of the world. And like most of the world, um, the average um, user is getting about three to four joints out of a gram. Um, and using between half and a gram a day. I just want you to have a look at the following pictures of the following spliffs and just tell me what's wrong with these joints. How would you make that joint better? <laughs> Sorry, roll it. <laughs> what would be the single most healthy thing you could do to make that spliff better? Take the tobacco out. So I'm going to keep coming back to this idea that one of the key public health strategies and clinical interventions we can do is to dissociate cannabis from tobacco use. It would be a really, really good thing to do. 
Um, in terms of why people are using, um, the majority of people in Scotland are using for purely recreational purposes, but you've got about 5% of people who say their use is almost solely or solely for medical use. And that's important because as the tides of change around medicinal cannabis occur, we need to respect that there are a group of people, tens of thousands of people in Scotland and the UK, who are already using cannabis for medicinal properties. And I think we need to start having a better understanding of exactly what it's doing and what it's helping. Um, it seems like a pretty safe drug to get with about 2% of people being involved in violence. I've got no idea if for Glasgow 2% in the last year just walking down the street is a pretty good figure. Oh dear, that fell flat. Um, what percentage of last year cannabis users do you think turn up to an A&E department or seek emergency medical treatment? What percentage? And this is for medical reasons as opposed to the fact it's the only place to get a Mars bar at 3 o'clock in the morning. This is a bit like Price is Right. 1%. It's almost like you saw this yesterday. You're right. It was about 1 in 100 users sought emergency medical treatment. Actually, it's almost the same rate as last year drinkers. Now, I actually think 1% is huge. Think of 100 people smoking dope. Some might actually get so unwell they have to seek emergency medical treatment. But it happens. This is based on data from 40,000 cannabis users. Um, and we saw a very similar rate around the world. And people turn up to A&E. Um, a bit more frequently in Scotland, it's about 1.4%, but they pitch up with very similar patterns of presentations. People turn up feeling anxious, paranoid, twitchy, agitated. But it's pretty much a short-term, self-limiting situation, and within about 12 to 24 hours, people pretty much feel back to normal. The drug most likely to land you there is the form of cannabis that's most commonly used around the world, which is high-potency cannabis, but some people pitch up there smoking commercial or and Katie told me this, um, council hash. I love it. Um, aside from that 1%, the truth is most people who use cannabis do so without ruining their lives. They don't develop a disorder, they don't become heroin users, they don't develop schizophrenia. Um, but there's quite a lot of people out in the community, your average run-the-mill cannabis smokers, who would like to use less. Um, and in fact, when you look at this, this is asking last year users of drugs, would you like to use less in the next year? And if so, would you like help? More people want to use less cannabis in the following year than any other group of drug users, and more people want help to use less than they do for drugs like alcohol or cocaine or MGMA. What that says to me is there is an untapped need in the community of happy-go-lucky cannabis users who would like our help to use less or use more safely, which is a good thing. Um, 10 to 15 percent of people who use cannabis are dependent. That rate probably goes up to about 15 to 20 percent for people who are starting to use in their early adolescence. Why? Because if you start using at the age of 12, you've got a whole bunch of other risk factors, whether it's abuse, deprivation, comorbid mental health problems. But what you've also got is a period of time where your brain is being exposed to cannabis when it's just much more vulnerable. And that's where we see the impacts of cannabis um, causing cognitive decline and also increasing the risk of schizophrenia. And it's that risk before the age of 15 that's really associated with that increase of risk, which is somewhere between one and a half and two times. Um, probably about one in 20 cannabis users, about half the people who are dependent would benefit from a medical prescribed intervention to help them quit. I'll talk about withdrawal management a bit later. Um, probably about one in five might need some comorbid support around mental health issues, most commonly anxiety, depression, social phobia, but virtually all of them could benefit from just quitting tobacco. I think a useful framework to have when you see cannabis users, whether they are in a youth service, whether they're in you know, a methadone um, clinic where cannabis is a secondary drug, is to think that there's always something you should be able to say following a quick assessment. The, the feedback might be, your cannabis use is okay at the moment. But if that feedback's gonna be given, you also need to make sure you have a conversation so that person understands that what might need to happen in their life for them to think, actually, it's not okay. Maybe if your school grades start falling, you start getting into debt, your relationship falls apart. Most people would be happier if they used a bit less. Most people might benefit if they changed the way they use. And there's probably some people who'd be better off if they just stopped particularly those people with severe mental illness. 
The problem is that most trialled interventions for cannabis use, particularly things like CBT, relapse prevention, motivational enhancement therapy, across the board don't seem to work very well for severe entrenched mental illness. In fact, the most effective intervention for people with severe mental illness when it comes to cannabis use is one, optimising the treatment for that underlying mental health condition, and maybe secondly, adding in things like contingency management, offering people non-drug reinforcers for maintaining abstinence. It's just unfortunate that the group who are most nailed by the harmful effects of cannabis are the group for whom we've got the least effective interventions. Um, you should have a nice little framework in your brain around harm reduction strategies that you can offer people. Um, harm reduction strategies are going to be most acceptable where they impact least on the pleasure that people get from drugs. Best harm reduction strategies in the world that mean people don't enjoy taking drugs means they won't get adopted. Um, giving people advice around how to use less. Start using later on in the day. Put less weed in your spliff. Um, think about helping people remove tobacco and combustible products from their lungs. It's really important. Um, and at the end, I'll talk about helping people quit. Um, anyway, um, I'm going to talk about what to change. And the first thing is clearly cannabis markets have changed in the last 20 years. 20 years ago, predominant form of cannabis would be soap bar, black cash, coming over from India, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Morocco, 3-4% THC, 3-4% CBD, um, and um, it was cheap, it was nasty, it got people stoned. Um, about 20% of the market was commercial press weed that comes over with seeds in it, again coming over from the African continent, 2-3% THC, 2-3% CBD. Um, it's the preferred sort of cannabis for old stoners now who just don't like um, the buzz they get from um, high potency cannabis which now dominates most markets in the Western world. Why? Because it's by far and away the most profitable product to sell. You can sell it locally with grow houses um, and you don't need to cross borders and it's what people want. And it's beautiful. Um, you can get um, auto-fertilising plants that will go from seed to fru um, uh, fruition in about three months. Um, you need lots of light and heat, um, which means that the police can bust you using thermal imaging helicopters or by um, linking in with your local electricity company. Or in this case in the street in Manchester, the police just drove down the street and went, that's a bit weird, that roof hasn't got any snow on it. And it's because there was a grow house in the roof, which was generating so much electricity, the snow melted. Um, or you can just pick up freebie plants when you go to build conferences. The, the question or not whether these different sorts of cannabis actually make any difference to people, Celia is going to talk to um, in the next session around the impact of CBD and THC. But at a very brutal level, if you give a thousand people some hash, some commercial and some skunk, and go, does it get you stoned differently? Um, the answer is yes. Unfortunately, what most people will say is the sort of cannabis they prefer, the skunk, the one that gives them the best high, <coughs> the skunk, the one that's most available, is skunk. Unfortunately, it's also the one that gives you the highest rates of memory impairment and paranoia. It's really unfortunate that the best high comes along with the worst side effects. It's also the one that seems to be associated with the highest rates of dependence and the highest rates of help seeking. So what would be really nice is if commercial cannabis growers actually grew something that was a little bit less THC and a little bit more CBD. Um, and my understanding working in a prison is that most manufacturers would be happy to do that as long as it doesn't impact on their profit. Now, having high potency cannabis products available is important because it's those the sorts of negative impacts from smoking high potency cannabis are the sorts of things that motivate people to change. So this is data from about three years ago. We asked 3,000 cannabis users, what are your major health concerns or your motivations for change? Um, and the, these figures here are for people who scored their worries as seven or more out of 10. So this is a, a serious issue for me. And as you can see, it's memory, mental health, and the impact on work and study. These are significantly motivating factors for change. The bit you may be less surprised by or more surprised by, is the fact that almost one in four cannabis users report being really worried about the impact of smoking on lung health and cancer. And I've become really obsessed by this as a target of intervention. Because it's just 
not something you can argue about. You can have long arguments about whether cannabis is really a cause of mental illness or bad for your brain. I know that inhaling thick poisonous smoke is crap for your lungs. There isn't an argument over that. Although, of course, you will find cannabis users who go, oh, no, no, cannabis is really good for my asthma. Bollocks. Every single cancer-causing chemical that exists in tobacco exists in um, cannabis. When you combust cannabis, you release all the same sorts of tars you do when you smoke tobacco. And we've become really effective um, in the UK at reducing rates of tobacco by making it socially unacceptable by focusing on physical health harms. So we need to try and shift um, people away from skinning up um, with tobacco, which is a problem because most of the world rolls with tobacco, apart from amazingly the Americans. It's difficult to look at America at the moment and think there's anything positive about that country when you look at Donald Trump and you maybe think the entire country is entirely stoned. But only 7% of the American population use tobacco when they use cannabis. For Kiwis, it's about one in four. The Aussies, it's about half. Most of the kind of developed world uses tobacco. And it's a real problem. Um, it's a real problem. Um, this is just in case you don't know how well join. Um, it's a real problem because cannabis and tobacco used together just lead to a whole range of problems. A, if you're a cannabis user, it's harder to quit tobacco. If you're a tobacco user, it's harder to quit cannabis. Withdrawal from cannabis and tobacco together is more difficult. Tobacco is also a gate. Sorry, cannabis is also a gateway drug to tobacco. Most people's first exposure now to tobacco is when they smoke a joint. So what you're doing is early cannabis use is associated with higher rates of um, tobacco dependence. And actually, all the four over the last kind of two decades around cannabis use and mental health, actually that's starting to shift to people thinking. Maybe it's not just early onset cannabis use. So this is a, a Lancet Psychiatry Review from last year where they started to explore the association of early onset tobacco use and the onset of psychotic illness. And those people who'd started smoking tobacco early had twice the risk of developing a psychotic illness. So whether or not that's just some association that's explained by other risk factors, social problems, cannabis use, we don't know. But maybe it's early nicotine exposure that's actually priming your brain. Um, it will probably come down to who you are. So there are people who can smoke cannabis every day from the age of 10 and they're never going to develop schizophrenia. There can be other people who are born with such a huge genetic loading for a psychotic illness that they can spend their life meditating on a Tibetan monastery you know, in India and they'll still develop schizophrenia. What cannabis use does for most people is precipitate the onset earlier in someone who is already going to develop that illness. And once you develop that illness, cannabis makes that prognosis worse. So higher rates of suicide, unemployment, resistance to medications, higher side effects from medications. Um, so I guess the advice that we need to give is to young people who have got a family history of psychotic illness, is lay off smoking weed, because you're going to be more vulnerable to problems. How we smoke is also a really important mediator of harm. So some people go, well, I know smoking is really bad, that's why I smoke in a bong. Smoking in bongs ain't safer. So I like the idea that people think that water filters out all the harmful stuff. It's not true. Water actually filters out more THC than it does tar, and what you end up doing is inhaling a large volume of smoke, which is cool, and holding it in your lungs for a longer period of time. It's a more dangerous way of using it. I like the fact that bong manufacturers um, light up bongs so stone people can find it in the dark, but it doesn't make it any safer. Um, nor does buying really big bongs, or making little plastic bongs, or turning it into vegetarian bongs, or even using um, edible bongs. My favourite photograph ever is this one, who is um, a Californian street artist who's converted an industrial leaf blower and a goldfish bowl into a bong. It doesn't make it safer, but you probably got very stoned. If you really want to reduce your risk, what you want to do is release THC without combusting it. And you can do that using a vaporizer. So this is the Volcano model, which is one of the first models that came out from Germany. Um, you've got a hot metal coil, and um, it uh, heats hot air that comes through the cannabis, heats the cannabis to a temperature where the THC gets released into an aerosol, um, but it doesn't combust it which means that about 95% of the carcinogens and other nasty stuff doesn't get created. 
and it gets you stoned. Um, people say the stone is slightly different, but entirely acceptable. Um, and as vaping technology changes, the opportunity of encouraging people to use products like this, I think is going to become really important. And, you know, um, there are really funky products, you know, variable temperatures, interchangeable, um, you know, heads and things. Um, you know, boys love this stuff. The other way of nudging people to think around the respiratory harms around their cannabis use is to use um, a little pocket spirometer. So your lungs should be as old as you. If you smoke tobacco or any sort of drugs, um, your lungs get old. So this is a project we initiated with our crack and heroin users who were really smug because they went, well, we don't inject. Like, there's no harm. And when you start feeding back to crack and heroin users that they've got lungs of an eight-year-old when they're 32, it kind of takes the smile off their face, but it also motivates them to change. And you can do the same thing with um, cannabis users. Um, these things cost about 100 quid. Um, we've got little motivational interviewing um, packs that give you an intervention to get people to think about quitting. Um, there are other ways of using. Um, these are marijuana suppositories, um, which have been developed on the back of the medicinal marijuana industry. I don't know if they're ever going to have any therapeutic in, uh, kind of purpose, but what I like is they come in different shapes and sizes. And what I can't figure out is whether you request the size of the... Anyway. Um, one of the things that we looked at last year um, was the acute risk of harm. Because it's very difficult to shift people's perceptions around drug-related risk when you're talking about things that are many years down the line. Um, the advantage of talking about drug-related emergency harms, or it's, it's tangible. Um, and we looked at them for lots of different drugs. And um, so, um, I guess the other reason is we also want to try and put into perspective some of the sort of crazy media headlines you get. Because acute harms are really good topics for newspapers. Um, and obviously lots of the headlines are, are often nonsense. Um, so legal high made me na run naked around Tesco. Um, this is my favorite one, legal drug team ripped his scrotum off. I can reliably tell you that headline was bollocks. Boom, boom. Um, this came out from Florida a few years ago. Flesh-eating zombie chewed my face off. I mean, what's the chance of a drug specifically making you want to chew someone's face off? The story behind this headline was of a homeless American man with untreated schizophrenia who, when the police eventually tested him, had a urine that was positive for marijuana. But a headline that says, shitty healthcare system left vulnerable man untreated with chronic mental illness. It's just not that good. Don't let fact get in the way of a good story. And I think for most people, acute harms are avoidable for most drugs. Because most drugs, it's related to, you know, dose and how you use it. But that's not actually the case with the drug that came out top for the last three years as being the drug that was most likely to land you in A&E. The drug that was most likely to land you in A&E in the last three global drug surveys was synthetic cannabis products. So last year, more than one in 30 users of synthetic cannabis products reported seeking emergency medical treatment, which is just a huge number. <coughs> It's absolutely huge. I would say that's probably on a par with you know, your average heroin user in treatment. It's a really high rate. Um, you know, just how often countries are using these drugs varies. Scotland was a little bit higher than the average. Um, New Zealand, which had a regulated market, about 4% of their population had used. I guess what I'm trying to get across is you don't have to have many people using these products in a community for it to make a significant impact on healthcare services or make headlines. So this was your seminal synthetic cannabinoid product, came out around 2004 to 2008, an inert herbal carrier that had a synthetic cannabis product dissolved in acetone sprayed on it. Packaged, sold. There's 400 different sorts of synthetic cannabinoid molecules out there. Loads of them haven't been profiled. What differentiates the most from THC is THC is a partial agonist. That means there is a limit to how stones you can get. These synthetic cannabinoid receptors are full agonists. More agonist, you get more stoned. They start creating effects in people that you just don't see in people who smoke weed. And because these products vary so much, even between packets that say it's the same product, 
the variation between one joint and the next from the same batch of products can be tenfold, which makes it really difficult to work out how big your spliff should be or how much should you, you should use. And those variations impact really hugely, both on the psychoactive effect that people get, but also the impact of those drugs on different bodily systems, whether it's your heart, your liver, your kidney, um, effect on getting seizures, etc. And, and as things have changed, we've moved from just having products that are in a herbal materials to now being able to buy liquids that you can fit into your e-cigarettes, um, powders and, and resins. Um, so I think we only had two people who said they'd injected these products last year. But there'll be people out there snoring them. I'm sure people have tried to smoke them directly. And there's lots of them. It's huge business. So we've been looking at these drugs for the last five years. And one of the first papers that we wrote simply profiled what the effect was like of synthetic versus natural cannabis. This was 1,000 people who'd used both drugs. And what it basically went is, synthetic cannabis products just weren't as nice. In fact, 93% of people said they preferred the real thing. And at the time, I thought, you know what? These aren't very nice drugs. People prefer the real thing. There's lots of weed about. These things will disappear. I was wrong. What changed was the molecule that was available. Because as one um, synthetic cannabinoid got outlawed by the EU or the FDA in the States, another one appeared. And unfortunately, as new ones appeared, they tended to become more potent. So now you've got synthetic cannabinoid um, agonists out there. They're 100 times more potent than THC, um, which is a problem. And it's caused problems. It's caused problems in the EU. Eastern Europe, Australia, New Zealand, America. Um, the states particularly have seen a huge spike in the number of people seeking emergency treatments. And you can see how variable it is depending on what products are available. So America saw um, a 300% spike in a three month period last year when one group of synthetic cannabinoid products got outlawed and a new group came in. Um, and people aren't just. Um, turning up to a &E after smoking it, but people are making cookies with this stuff, which I would advise against hugely. The other bit that was really interesting, it was older people who seemed to be getting the more serious, unwanted physical um, health effects. So people in their 30s and 40s. Um, so we tried to put out lots of information going, this stuff really is much more dangerous, hoping that people will reduce their use. Um, last year we looked at some of the data we had and we estimated that the risk of seeking emergency medical treatment on synthetic cannabis was at least 30 times higher than on natural cannabis. We're redoing that now with a sample that's about 10 times the size. I think that figure's probably more in the region of 150 times. Not only are you more likely to turn up to A&E, but what you turn up with is different. You're much more likely to turn up psychotic, severely aggressive, with seizures. Very few people turn up to A&E fitting on cannabis, but it was about 20% of people um, turning up with fits, in fact, 30% of people turning up with fits with synthetic cannabis products. Not only are you turning up with a more severe symptom profile, but you're not recovering. So most people, unless you have an underlying mental health problem, within about 24 hours on cannabis, are pretty much back to normal. With a synthetic cannabis product, almost 25% of people hadn't got back to normal within two to four weeks. You can see 15% of people said they hadn't got back to normal yet after several months. So this is a group of drugs that are so potent and so unpredictable that regardless whether or not you've got an underlying mental health problem, your risk of your landing yourself into trouble is high. And not surprisingly, the more often you take the drug, the greater that risk is. So for people who had used synthetic cannabis products more than 100 times in the last year, one in eight reported seeking emergency medical treatment. That sort of steep dose response curve you see with a drug like crystal meth. There is no other recreational drug in the UK at the moment that has that sort of hit rate. Um, they turn up agitated, aggressive, violent. They're a problem for A&E departments. They're a problem for paramedics. They're a problem for police. When you look at American data, they describe 10% of the presentations as being life-threatening, um, at least 50% requiring some sort of intervention. And in our study, about two-thirds were admitted to hospital. So the health burden, even of one person in one A&E department, is potentially huge. You get headlines talking about lethal cannabis products. 
actually there have been deaths reported. There's probably been about 20 odd fatalities reported from synthetic cannabis products, normally from heart attacks, normally in young people, but also from multi-organ failure, renal failure, um, and various bits of trauma. In most instances, other drugs have been used, commonly alcohol. Um, they've got a pretty high hit rate for running you into problems. Um, acutely, you just want to make sure these people don't hurt themselves, you want to make sure they don't hurt anyone else, and you want to make sure that the medics take this seriously enough to do sensible medical things, like an ECG, like some blood tests. And you keep them in hospital till they're safe. For people admitted to mental health units, it's that whole issue of tracking the pathology with days of abstinence. What you don't want is people to leave on a script of an antipsychotic if all they had was a brief drug-induced psychotic episode. But once you've had one brief drug-induced psychotic episode, you're much more likely to experience another one, um, even if you take a very small amount of the drug in the future. If you've got a very potent form of the drug, not only would you expect it to have a higher rate of people seeking emergency medical treatment, but you'd also expect it to have a risk of dependence and withdrawal. And unfortunately, that's what we also saw. So this was about 2,000 people from last year's Global Drug Survey. <coughs> And we basically said to anyone who'd used synthetic cannabis products in the last year, we said, have you tried to stop? And if so, did you notice any of these symptoms? So you've got about a third of people describing symptoms that you kind of see when people quit, quit smoking cannabis. If you looked at the instance in people who'd used more than 50 times in the last year, that went up to about two thirds. So for me, what you've got is a drug that is creating physical dependence and withdrawal at a much earlier rate in people's use histories than you get with synthetic cannabis products. And that's a problem. And my guess is that gradually treatment services are going to start seeing people. There's no treatment trials about how to treat synthetic cannabis withdrawal. I think the best guide is to look at the sort of symptoms we get in natural cannabis withdrawal and how we treat that. So this is data from 2,000 cannabis users looking at withdrawal symptom severity. And in natural cannabis users, um, what you've got is people predominantly talking about irritability, restlessness, poor sleep, weird dreams, sweatiness and agitation. Generally worse in women than men, worse when you stop suddenly, worse when you're using a lot. And for most people, it lasts for about three to four days. The majority of symptoms are over by about day seven. Um, some symptoms like irritability, anger, weird dreams can continue for several weeks. Um, but what we know is that um, in terms of treating cannabis withdrawal, um, there are a couple of things that make a difference. And the reason I'm mentioning this is that we can probably extrapolate what's effective for cannabis withdrawal for what's going to be effective for managing synthetic cannabis withdrawal. So the first thing is people's withdrawal is worse if they stop smoking a lot as opposed to a little. No shit, Charlotte. Um, it's also worse if they're forced to stop because their dealer gets busted or they get banged up as opposed to the fact that they've gradually reduced and planned to stop. So what that means is the first step to helping people stop any sort of drug, whether it's alcohol or heroin or whatever, is to get people just to cut down. Cut down ain't rocket science. Smaller slits, smaller rizzlers, put your joint out. Don't start smoking first thing in the day. Reduce your caffeine consumption. Lots of chronic pot smokers drink huge amounts of caffeine to offset the fact they're stoned all the time. Really interestingly, tobacco induces the metabolism of caffeine. So when you stop smoking tobacco, your caffeine levels go through the roof. If you stop smoking weed and tobacco and you carry on drinking as much tea and coffee or Coca-Cola as normal, your caffeine levels will shoot through the roof, which will make your irritability, your insomnia, your sweating, your agitation worse. So cutting back on tea and coffee is really important. Prescribing to people who report severe insomnia, restlessness, aggression, is fine. You know, as long as it's time limited, it's supervised, it's not occurring in the context of being able to flog their benzos or top up with a bottle of scotch. Low dose diazepam, a bit of sopiclone at night, four to seven days can help people get over what can be really distressing insomnia particularly if some of the dreams they're getting were associated with past traumas and things. So I'd encourage any GPs who are in the room or other prescribers, you know, a little bit of night sedation ain't a bad thing when you want people to stop using it. Um, really good sleep hygiene is important, 
And by that I mean no tea and coffee after two o'clock in the afternoon, no fluids two hours before you go to bed, empty your bladder before you go to sleep, no day naps, always waking up at the same time. When you go to bed, if you can't fall asleep, you leave the bedroom, make sure the TV's off, radio off. Basic sleep hygiene is something that lots of our clients have never paid attention to. Why? Because their sleep hygiene was taking a benzo or getting stoned. When you take those things away, they need some legally alternative um, options. And NRT, also really important. Withdrawal off both cannabis and tobacco at the same time is worse. So give them NRT. Inhalers, tabs, gum, patches are fine, but take your patches off at night. Because some people get really weird patches with dream, uh, get really weird patches, really weird dreams when they use patches. So take them off at night. Sleep, really important. Um, so anyway, that's the summary of how to get people off. Cut down, bit of psychoeducation, get them to drop tobacco out, NRT, um, you know, get them to start smoking the first cliff later in the day, and then come up with a quick date. And I'd ask most people to get down below about half a gram a day um, before you eventually say, fine, this is your stop date, let's give you some meds. The other thing I think you should be doing is getting people to exercise. Exercise is not only just a good non-drug reinforcer, it's not only a good way of reminding people how knackered their lungs are, but there's also some evidence that exercise promotes the release of cannabis from fat stores, and that little dribble of THC from your stores might kind of help sort of ameliorate cannabis withdrawal in the weeks and months following cessation. Um, there was going to be an NPS bill passed on April the 6th, and the rumours I hear is ain't, that ain't going to happen. I'd love to think it's because the government's suddenly been influenced by evidence and common sense. Clearly that's not the case. Um, but it's worth just thinking what would happen to the synthetic cannabis products issue if it got banned. Actually, we can look to New Zealand for what happens. So New Zealand had a regulated market. You could buy these products from shop fronts, and they banned it. And these are headlines over the last six months. Um, still a problem dealing through the community, causing problems in Auckland, people being robbed, and drugs that are really cheap and really potent ain't going to lose their market. So NPS has originally found their place, you know, in 2009 where there wasn't very good much coke, there wasn't very good much MDMA, Mephedrone came along, offered a cheap acceptable alternative. Um, so the motivator for NPS use used to be other drugs aren't available or the quality of other drugs that are available aren't very good. We've tracked the motivations for use over the last five years and last year the biggest motivator for people using NPS was they are cheap. And the people who end up using cheap and nasty drugs are those people who have already got nailed by society. They're homeless, they're disadvantaged, they're bound up in jail and it's going to be that group who I think we're going to see synthetic cannabis products migrate towards. Because the truth is, I think you put most people on a desert island, you give them a nice supply of nice drugs, they won't bother taking synthetics. Now, I, I, I was pretty confident about this statement a year ago, and a few people came up and went, you're wrong. Um, so in this year's Global Drug Survey, we have a section called Desert Island Drugs. And it said to people, if you were on a desert island and you had a plentiful supply of magic mushrooms and cannabis, and for some reason a really good supply of good quality coke and MDMA, and a passing ship came by and said, you can give up any of those drugs for any new drug in the world, what would you give up? I haven't looked at the results yet, but I'm banking on 90% of the drug using population going on your bike. The other motivations for continuing to use these drugs will be to avoid detection. So I work in a prison. Three years ago, I used to smell skunk outside my clinic. I used to smile because I thought people were taking the piss, but People didn't go off to A&E, they didn't beat up prison wardens, they didn't come and threaten me that often. Now, I smell, snow, I smell no skunk, but we have people blue lighted out. So these products have value in prison because it avoids MDTs. People use it because it's cheap. And this is going to be the group who are going to continue using it because there will be people who are stockpiling these drugs by the kilo, ready to continue flogging it to a vulnerable group who have motivations to use a drug which might not be detected on drug tests, or might keep them off their face more cheaply than shitty quality heroin. Um, so I don't think the drug ban is going to actually impact on the most vulnerable people. What you should do in prisons? I think you should stop testing for cannabis. 
And I think you'd probably find the market for a lot of these drugs would diminish. I don't think that's going to happen. So synthetic cannabis is not the only super potent form around at the moment. Um, what we've got now is um, butane hash oil, um, which looks like wax, or it's called shatter, or honey, or butter. Um, and it's made by basically pumping a solvent through a herbal product and collecting solvent-soluble THC um, into some little sticky material. You don't have to use butane hash oil. You can use alcohol as a solvent or other things. Um, this stuff's about 70 to 80% THC. And your immediate worry is whenever you purify and get a really potent form of a drug, you end up with problems. So um, America's saying, is this the new crack? People certainly smoke it a bit like crack. You get a little dab on the end of a nail and you tip it onto a little pipe. Um, that's actually not such a bad thing, you know. Because um, one of the advantages of using super potent forms of cannabis is it does encourage people to use non-tobacco routes of administration. So this is from 2,500 uh, butane hash oil users. And you can see 70% use non-tobacco routes of administration. It could be a fantastic public health um, uh, issue if we could move people away. Of course, you also worry about people then inhaling more potent forms of cannabis, getting more tolerant, getting higher rates of dependence, um, and becoming obsessed with buying new toys. So we asked people what they thought about the risks. So um, how easy is it to titrate the effect? 36% um, it was easier with butane hash oil. How quickly do you get the feeling you want from BHO compared to skunk? 62% said it was quicker with BHO. How long are you stoned for? People generally thought they were longer stoned with BHO. Quicker onset, more stoned, getting stoned for longer. Sounds like a pretty risky effect profile. Um, possibly building up tolerance a bit more quickly. People weren't convinced they got more withdrawal. Um, when you actually looked what the stone was like, it pretty much looked like high potency cannabis. Um, which is a bit unfortunate, because of course you should be able to make butane hash oil with 30% CBD, 30% THC if you want it. So there is a possibility this drug actually may offer people um, some options in what they smoke and how they smoke. Um, they better be careful, because quite a lot of people try and make this themselves, and you can imagine a bunch of people stoned playing with butane light fluid um, canisters um, end up blowing themselves up. And there are butane hash oil explosions, a bit like Breaking Bad, occurring all over the states. So much so that California's actually passed a law, um, you know, that's probably harsher for the possession of cannabis for people um, who are trying to make this stuff at home. The bit I want to finish off is that the truth is most people who use cannabis in the community and have got problems will never talk to you or me or anyone around their cannabis use. Um, they will either carry on smoking until something happens and they quit themselves, um, or their partner threatens to leave them, or they develop a mental health problem, or their lungs pack up. But I've already said, there's lots of people out there who would like to use less, who would like help, or would like to use more safely. Um, and, and I think we can use digital um, health interventions to help inform people and nudge their behaviour. Um, so what we do with a lot of the Global Drug Survey information is we package it into... Um, online apps that people can use to get some feedback. So this is um, the cannabis drugs meter. Um, and what it does is it just lets you choose what sort of cannabis you're using. Um, and then you can choose what sort of joint you roll. So I painstakingly spent hours weighing up the amount of cannabis in each of these joints. So you can pick on the joint you use, you can say how many of these you use a day, and then you can work out how much you've spent. Um, and people like that, and they get feedback on how much money they've spent. Um, and then they get to compare their use to other people, and it gives them advice on how to cut down and things. And I think now, or certainly by the end of April, you should be able to compare your cannabis use to about 140,000 other cannabis users. So it's, it's a, an interesting way of people going, I'm smoking two grams a day, I'm just like everyone else. It's like, no, you're not. You're actually in the top 5% of cannabis users around the world. And it's like, oh. The other thing I've become quite interested in, though, particularly on the back of cannabis becoming regulated in the States, is if we really are going to legalise cannabis, then we better have some guidelines, in the same way that we have guidelines that exist for alcohol, around recommended amounts. Now, the reality is we don't have guidelines for illicit drugs, because 
drugs are illicit because they're dangerous and therefore the government has told us, well, all drug use is bad and basically zero tolerance. And it's just not true, really. You know, a little bit of a drug every once in a while may not be that harmful to quite a lot of people. But the difficulty developing guidelines is, is they're, um, they're generally created by scientists and researchers and they don't have that much meaning to people who use drugs. And the truth is the most credible source of information to people who use drugs are not doctors and nurses and people who work in the drug field. Katie might be a bit of an exception. She's kind of probably very credible because she's got very cool hair and is a DJ. But actually the most credible source of information is other people who use drugs. So what we did last year, is that all right? No. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, what we did last year is we asked 40,000 cannabis users to help us develop guidelines for safer cannabis use. Um, not harm reduction guidelines, but how much cannabis can you use, how often, and what level of risk does that carry? So we produced these last years, and we've had about 35,000 people now who have found out what their use is doing to them. Um, and although the Daily Mail went, scientists say one small joint a week won't harm your health, that wasn't what we said. But God bless the Daily Mail. Um, it starts off with a big disclaimer, saying clearly don't take drugs kids, they're really bad for you, don't take drugs when you're young, guidelines don't make drug use safe. Um, but then what it does, and it takes three minutes, is it just says, how often do you use cannabis? Now, these um, frequencies weren't determined by us, um, they were determined by um, the 40,000 cannabis users. We said, how, how rare is very rare? How often is very often? So they came up with three to four times a year, once a month, twice a week, one day. Anyway. Um, and then we said to them, okay, how much do you smoke? And we asked them, what do you think a very low amount is to use on a day, a low amount, a medium amount? These are the figures they came up with, not us. So you put down your frequency, how much you use, and you get a score. And um, people could rate the scores from one to 10. The maximum score anyone could get was seven. And what we do is we feed back to individuals what that level of use means in terms of risk and harm to their health. Um, and it's written in kind of fairly friendly language um, that at times almost be, might be marginally amusing or not. Um, and people can get an idea of what they need to do to reduce their risk a little bit. Um, there's information around how to detox. So all the stuff I've spoken around, cutting down and detoxing, all of those things are um, on that app. We're hoping to produce the same guidelines for cocaine and MGMA and ketamine. We just have to get around to it. Um, so I've finished five minutes early, which is remarkable, which probably means I should have spoken more slowly. Um, but I'll say thank you and I'm happy to take any questions for a couple of minutes.